the show goes on the official show on the fish stripes podcast channel where we cover the miami marlins every day in our own way under these weird circumstances i'm eli sussman that's that's isaac azut that's daniel rodriguez and they are joining me for a highly anticipated interview that's been on my mind since the lockout started like three plus months ago you might not believe that but it really has been mulling in my head because we're 10 years removed from the rebranding and the relocation of the Marlins franchise, 10 years removed from the franchise, a season with the Miami Marlins. The, the first year that they rebranded, Showtime followed them around for uh, what turned out to be not the entire season, but most of the season at New Marlins Park. It was a unique slice of fish history for that 2012 season. As um, David Gavant, the executive producer of that show, he said at the time, quote, it was a portrait of what it's like to be a major league baseball player through the prism of the Miami Marlins. Uh, and to explain what that means, I felt like the perfect guy to track down to reflect on that series was David Gavant himself. And he was gracious enough to uh, join us here on the pod to keep it real with what happened, what he saw behind the scenes, uh, understanding why the project came together in the first place and why it was kind of the last of its kind <laughs> as part of this series, surprisingly, uh, for some variety of reasons. Just a whole lot to dive into. So without further ado, we want to revisit that masterpiece of yours that you helped put together. David, thanks so much for being here and giving us this time. Well, my pleasure, guys. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, thanks for reaching out. It's, uh, it's hard to believe that it's been, you know, 10 years already uh, since uh, the franchise uh, aired on, on uh, Showtime that season. So uh, it's, it's really nice uh, that you guys reached out and I uh, can kind of give you some insider information about how this production actually uh, came about. Even though this was in 2012, I mean, from what I understand, you were with MLB Productions long before this started. You had a whole lot of involvement in the other collaborations they did with different networks. Um, I just actually, why don't you just kind of give us a rundown of what exactly that job was uh, beginning, what, in the late 90s, all the way through like 2015? We want to hear more about that. Yeah, so I, um, I'm originally from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. I was working at CNN Sports all through high school and college. And when I graduated, I came up to New York uh, to come work at the NBA. And so I worked at NBA Entertainment for about 12 years, um, did a lot of work with uh, this guy named Michael Jordan. Um, and uh, saw some great basketball over over that 12 years. Uh, but I always had a passion for baseball. When I was in Atlanta, um, you know, the Braves were were there, and uh, I actually saw Hank Aaron hit 715. Uh, I was at the ballpark and uh, have always just been uh, a baseball fan. And so the only the only reason why I even considered leaving the NBA is because it would be for Major League Baseball, because I just thought I just had the ability to tell really great, great stories um, of players. You know, you're a superstar player. If you fail, you know, seven out of 10 times, you know, you're, you're a 300 hitter, uh, uh, you're um, you're considered a Hall of Fame player. So. Um, just the dynamics of being able to tell really great stories of how players really have to, you know, ride the, go through the minors and, and really kind of be humble in order to get to the, get to the majors. And, and really their job is to get a hit every day. So it was just, uh, uh the opportunity ex presented itself in the late nineties. Um, so I left, uh, right when the whole Sosa McGuire, uh, 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 race for the record was, was happening. And what people don't remember about that is that it was on the cover of the New York Times every single day for the entire summer. The, the whole country was just riveted. So, um, so did a lot of work uh, all through the, the, you know, the not aughts and the and 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 all through uh, my career to Major League Baseball Productions. We did everything from This Week in Baseball, the series that was on Fox, to home videos, to commercials, to Thirty for Thirties um, um, uh, for ESPN and uh, document documentaries on HBO and, of course, uh, um, two seasons of the franchise on Showtime. Right. This being this was the second season of the show. The previous season was in 2011 with, at the time, the reigning World Series champion San Francisco Giants. That one kind of feels like a no-brainer that you would select that team at that time in that market with those storylines. Uh, before I hand it over to the rest of my guys, I want to understand exactly what the process was of – kind of whether it was awarding the Marlins, whether the Marlins themselves uh, kind of chose themselves to be featured in the 2012 season. What was that whole 
process, decision-making process to make them the second team that was featured on the show? Well, this is where it's, it's going to give you some insider information. So um, just to, to kind of give you some background, like you said, this was season two. And as running Major League Baseball Productions, our goal, our job was to promote the league, the team, and the players. And the whole premise was how do we do something like Hard Knocks that was continually getting a ton of recognition for the NFL, not only for the general public who was watching on HBO, but also the sports industry as well. So the, the, the real difference between from a planning perspective was that the NFL, the league, they mandated that when NFL films and HBO sports came knocking, they, the team had to demonstrate the reason why they didn't want to participate or turn down filming. The, the NFL basically instituted you know, rules that you have to participate in hard knocks. Sure, the same team wouldn't be selected you know, over multiple years. Uh, there'd have to be some space in between, some time in between seasons, but the, so the same team wouldn't be featured all the time. MLB, on the other hand, couldn't mandate that any team participate. So uh, we had to use, when I say we, MLB Productions, we had to really use our professional and personal relationships to secure, uh, secure, uh, secure participation. Because of all the programming and all the, all the field work that we were doing, um, uh, with the, the teams and the players uh, over the over about a decade, people, all the players knew and trusted Major League Baseball Productions. We stood for high quality content. We were always going to make them look good. We were going to delve into some really great questions. And um, so we started developing like a trust with all the players. Whenever an MLB Productions crew showed up, they knew that they were going to get covered and uh, and get promoted. And so we we started to build some really, really strong uh, relationships with uh, with the players. So um, so our, our first season was with the San Francisco Giants. Like you said, they were the reigning World Series champions looking to maintain momentum, so to speak, and grow their brand. And I recall uh, the president, Larry Bear, to his credit, saying, you know, participating in the franchise was a responsibility that as World Series champions, they felt like they had to do. And it was a great first year. Uh, we won a National Sports Emmy for for that production. It, it's kind of like it was kind of like the the genesis of all these all access type pe uh, documentaries that you're seeing all over Netflix now. It was basically let's get in there, let's be flies on the wall. They trust us. Let's just get some great content and quickly edit those into half hour shows. We had made the deal with Showtime. Um, they wanted to have sports content at the time. I believe they had the uh, this week in the NFL, and they were looking to expand their sports roster. So, um, uh, so the, 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 that first year with the Giants was just great. It had, we had a lot of great content, a lot of controversy, uh, but it was spun in a, in, a, in a really good way. So, so for, to be honest, in, in the second year of the franchise, we were struggling to find a team. You know, MLB teams are very insular. It's, it's a regional sport that really has national appeal during the postseason. And despite like numerous calls from our chief business officer, uh, a gentleman by the name of Tim Brosnan, no teams wanted to participate for fear of all this insider access would somehow show secrets that they didn't want out there. They, they didn't want to share. So th this is probably why the Astros never wanted to participate, by the way. Um, yeah. Uh, but but uh, we got lucky, frankly, with with the Marlins, who literally at the last hour, you know, we were we were actually thinking that we might have to cancel the series because not one of the teams that we knocked on the doors wanted to participate. Believe it or not, they didn't want that insider access. They didn't want people, you know, nosing around, even though they knew it was MLB Productions and it was somebody that they could trust. Um, they just didn't see what the upside was. And, you know, and, and a lot of that was, you know. Poor decision making on their part, but again, the Marlins—they had a lot to, to to talk about. There was the, the new name change, team change, the new ballpark, and uh, and they said we are fully in. We want to do this, and that's how the second season of the the franchise uh, happened. You know, I'm actually curious. You know, when you said you chose the my Marlins, sort of agreed to it. Was there any hesitation in the Marlins' part? Or was there anyone that you know had to be convinced to agree to do this? Because I know David Sampson, the president at the time, was very on board with it. And he did mention that maybe the owner was a little bit hesitant when agreeing to this. Yeah, David was a huge champion of ours uh, to get this done. He 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 has you know he was in charge of the business of the team and uh, has a marketing bent. 
And like you said, how much attention did the ha, has the team had on a, on a national level? What was the platform? This was a perfect platform. Um, you know, they, they did have a chance to look at all the content. If there was something on there that they said, you know, that that's giving away a little bit of a competitive advantage. We don't want that in there. So they did have the ability to come in and take a look and say, um, you know, we don't want this in there. Or they did say, hey, you guys got to be here. We're filming something that you got to come see. Um, they were they were, um, you know, after that first couple of weeks where we were started to be on site, they would literally pick up the phone and call us. So I think at first everybody's a little a little hesitant because they just don't know what they're getting into and how much it's going to take and what the involvement is. But, you know, once they kind of saw that, you know, we weren't going to be intrusive, we weren't going to be putting microphones in people's faces, that we we're really just trying to be flies on the wall and capture that content as it happened. Yeah, and for the players, how were their reactions when finding out, you know, they were going to be filmed and then shown on almost uh, national television? Was there some players that maybe came up to you and maybe asked to be filmed less? Were other players maybe more ecstatic to be filmed, maybe asking to be filmed more than other players? Or was it just seemingly, you know, most players just really wanted to be on it? I think for the second year, uh, the the good news is, is that most of the players, all the players, had seen what we had had, had, had produced for the for the Giants, and so uh, we never got any pushback from any players uh, when we were, we were in the second year with the Marlins. To be honest, for the first year in in San Francisco, we did get a couple of the older veteran players who were just like, you know, this is not, you know, this is taboo. We don't we don't provide inside information. Um, uh, to, uh, um, you know, all access type shows. So there were some players who physically said, do not film me. I do not want to be on this whatsoever. But, you know, the Marlins were a young team and a lot of the younger players, you know, grew up watching reality TV, right? And so they got it. And I think because we had done, like I said, the franchise with the Giants the year before, they understood what we were trying to go after. So, um, uh, so we didn't get any 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 pushback or anybody saying, "No, you can't come with me." There would be times where people would say, "Players would say, hey, I'm going home. You guys want to follow me home? Or I'm driving over here. Or I'm going to play video games, etc." And so we we just are we're, we're, I'm hanging out with you know hanging out with uh, uh, you know one of the players. We're going to go swimming at the pool, you know that kind of thing. So we we got a lot of great content. Yeah, I'll go ahead, Eli. Well, yeah, I was curious about you know the start of the production process. From what I recall, it, it seemed there was a whole lot of spring training shots and time spent over there. When exactly did the cameras start rolling, and what did the shooting schedule look like from there onward? Were they just shooting every single day from there until the final episode, or how much uh, how much effort was involved just to grab all the material even before having to worry about narrowing it down to what appears during that series itself. Well, the, the great thing is, is that the series didn't start until after the all-star game, right? So it started like the, it started like mid July, but at, you know, during spring training players are just much more relaxed. They're, you know, they're open to doing uh, much, you know, many more things that they're not opening open to do when the regular season is underway. So um, that's that's the reason why we had such a heavy presence during spring training. We wanted people to kind of get used to our cameras being around and kind of being ubiquitous and kind of just being blending into the background. So by the time that, you know, the season did roll around, you know, they, they were used to having us part of the team and used to us being there. So we actually filmed a tremendous amount for spring training. You know, I think uh, you're, you know, the, the whole Ozzy during spring training when he, when, he, when he's, uh, you know, introducing the team, you know, everybody's down there at, at, at camp and, you know, the F-bombs galore, um, which just made great television. It's exactly the kind of thing that Showtime was looking for. He, Ozzy was such a character. Um, and, uh, and then we just kind of stayed, uh, stayed with it. So, for the first two sh episodes, we actually had <clears throat> obviously had plenty of time to the first the first show, if I recall, was an hour long and it was comprised mm -hmm. of uh, basically comprised of spring training and then kind of getting you up to speed for for the rest to where we were up to that part in the season. So we had plenty of time. I mean, we probably went through like a thousand hours of uh of content uh just for that that hour-long show and it's it's not a true hour it's like 52 minutes something like that but uh um um it was uh, a lot of great content for that first show the second show i think we had the first 
the, the after the se- after the first show, all the the remaining episodes were a half hour. So I think for that second show, we had the first fifteen minutes already pre cut again from content, bringing you up to speed up to that point. And then it was basically all star content, if I if I recall correctly. It was uh, content that we had filmed at the all star game with some of the players that were there. Um, and then from then on, it was uh, you know the remaining thirty minute episodes. We would literally film up until Monday night. And we'd have a 24-hour turnaround and, and and run over to Showtime with the physical, at that point, it was a physical tape as opposed <laughs> to being a digital copy. You'd run over to Showtime and, and they'd throw it on air. Literally running to get the copy of that in their hands. Wow. Yes, exactly. And uh, as the YouTube viewers can see here, uh, Ozzy Guillen, you know, almost instantly in the first month of the season, the biggest controversy of the season occurred, you know, with Ozzy Guillen saying what he said regarding, you know, Cuba and Fidel Castro. For you guys, though, was it almost like entertainment goldmine that something like that happened? Or was it like, you know, crap, we don't really we, we don't want this. We didn't want this. Happen. We wanted to focus more on baseball or were you guys were the, you know, the entertainment team really happy about it? Well, we, 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 we really like Ozzy and we weren't really happy, you know, f- for him, you know, that he had to go through this. It, uh, Ozzy, Ozzy doesn't have a filter on it as, as I don't know. He, so he just says whatever comes to his mind. I, I don't think what he said he, he meant, I don't, obviously I don't think if he knew that it was caused this firestorm that, that, uh, that he, he would have said it. Um, I, 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 do I, do I think he meant what he said? I, I don't think so. I don't know. It was just a, an, un, an unfortunate situation. So first and foremost, you know, because Ozzy was such great television, uh, we felt bad for him because we know him as a person. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. He wasn't out to hurt anybody. He wasn't out to say anything controversial. Um, and, uh, but you know, like, like we, we like controversy for, for, for the, for the franchise because it helps drive the narrative. And just like, you know, this print newspaper, the print uh, magazine article that was in, you know, they, they picked up on this also because it helped, you know, drive that, that article as well. Um, so so not really, uh, you know, condoning what what, what he said or, or not. Um, but um, so first of all, we kind of we felt bad for him because he had given us so much for the show. But it does add conflict for the show. It did add a lot of drama, especially because that's one of those situations where the team said and Ozzy agreed you know, we're going to suspend him. We're going to, we want your cameras in there when we do it. So that is, you can find that clip on YouTube. Um, there's like a minute and a half clip on YouTube where you can actually see um, um, David Sampson and the, and the general manager uh, suspending him for five, five games and Ozzy profusely apologizing to anybody who he might've offended. Um, and, uh, um, and uh, so it made for, it made for great, made for great television but i just don't think the relationship with the team and with the fan base and with the city of miami was really the same after after that situation yeah to expand expand a little more on ozzy there was probably one of the biggest moments or probably one of the most viewed now on youtube are the meetings between him and heath bell heath bell you know with the big closure that they got in free agency and it you know he didn't live up to expectations just how is it when you're filming a meeting between a star player signed a big contract and the manager where the players at their lowest and the manager is telling them the truth and what he, they need to hear. You know, I, I think it's, I think it's a fine line because you never really want to embarrass anybody. Um, and, uh, but you also want to be truthful and you want to help tell, tell the story. I mean, Heath was a big uh, free agent signing, I think uh, that year, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And there was a lot of high expectation for, uh, of him and uh you know I, I he he was just going through a rut like a, i think players do you know it's a long season and and uh um and i think uh that was just his time um and uh, i'm not I, I don't know if he necessarily knew that um uh, you know he he agreed for our cameras to be there and Ozzy was fine too uh but uh, so it was a really that this this video also is on uh, youtube where uh where Ozzy uh basically tells him that uh you know that uh he, he was benched for a while he didn't you know and and heath was like you know starting to get in his head like every pitch is somebody looking over my shoulder and i'm going to be pulled out and 
that was such a great scene where where Ozzy said, "No, no, no, just go out there and throw. You're my, you're my, you're, you know, you're my, you're my guy. You're my relief pitcher." But um, so to, to have those kind of opportunities where you have the trust, where the team is going to call you to say, "Hey, we have a, a big moment happening. You might want to be in here. We don't know what's going to happen, but you might want to come in and and uh, and, and and just be a fly on the wall." Um, it is probably you know it, it exposes a you know, what the business of baseball is like, you know, it doesn't matter if he's a great guy or what have you, they have a job to do. And sometimes you're going to be in a rut and, uh, and the manager has to, has to make the tough decisions. So I think, um, I think that was a, a very particular moment that you don't really see in sports and, um, uh, and it helped kind of propel the narrative of, uh, you know, what was going on uh, during that season. I'm curious exactly how much creative freedom, what you and your team had to, put what you wanted out there. You, you did cover some, like, besides that meeting, besides the Azagian suspension, like really intimate moments that were uh, really powerful moments. I'm wondering if there were any, any moments that were captured either with cameras or just with microphones that, that you felt would, would have been really compelling content, but perhaps went too far with like reflecting poorly on the Marlins organization. Were, were there any certain like matters that were taboo and off limits things that felt were really juicy but <laughs> had to actually hold on to and weren't able to use just because this is ultimately a major league baseball production no you know what we like to do you know when i worked for the nba it was uh it was back in the you know the 90s it was a it was a very different marketing um initiative uh you know everything uh it, 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 and, and at major league baseball it was very very different we you know decided in a couple of couple of my guys uh you know one of my my right hand guy my who was also executive producer on the show by the name of david check he came over with me from the uh, the nba and we decided that we were we understood that we worked for major league baseball and that we were the marketing arm of the league and we had a job to do, but our responsibility, our, our, our feeling was that it was almost going to be like dead man walking is the way we looked at it. Like we might show the guy walking to the electric chair, but we're not going to show how he got there or what happens in the aftermath. So that's kind of like our philosophy was is that we're going to show what happened. We're not going to comment on it. We're not going to say whether that person was right or wrong. We're just going to show it and leave it up to the audience to determine, you know, make their own determination uh, as to as to what happened. Um, and we did that throughout our course at uh, at at at, uh, at uh, Major League Baseball. There was a time um, early in, in when we were there in 2000, for example, when the uh, the Mets and Yankees were in the World Series in 2000. And there was a time where uh, Piazza was going up against Clemens and uh, uh, Piazza's bat broke and went back the bat shattered and almost hit Clemens on the mound and Clemens picked up the bat and threw it at Piazza. I think if, you know, something like that, um, you know, we, we weren't going to delve into, we weren't going to get a quote from both those guys and say, Hey, what was going on? What were you feeling? What were you thinking at that time? We were just going to show it because it ha we had a responsibility. This happened in the game and we were going to show it. And so that's kind of the philosophy that we took with the shooting of the franchise, whatever the controversy was, we were going to show it. We were going to try and glorify it. We were going to try and, in we weren't going to try and amp up the narrative if it wasn't there. We just wanted to kind of show it and present it as it was happening in real real time. And I, I think you're making a great example for it. one of the controversies in that season earlier was the Hanley Ramirez, Jose Reyes. You know, one of them didn't want to move over to third base. And they did that whole scene, like you mentioned, where they were playing video games with each other to make sure that, hey, we're OK with each other. Did that seem possibly, you know, a little fake or, you know, were they really trying their best to be to, you know, get along with each other? Because that, that was a bit of an issue initially. Um, I you know what those maybe they had issues with it away from each other, um, yeah. uh, but they were friends. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they both were like, you know, if it was somebody else, they probably would have been, I don't know if they would have been more vocal. They probably would have expressed the same thing, but at the end of the day, they weren't mad at each other. They didn't put themselves in that situation kind of thing. They were, they 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 were still friends. And, and I know when Hanley was traded, I know that uh, Jose was, you know, kind of devastated. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, so, um, so I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it was, it was manufactured. They were, um, they were already friends beforehand, you know, mm -hmm. the, so um, so I, I don't 
I don't I don't think there was any kind of controversy that we had to steer to stir up. We just showed them talking about it. And that was really the first time that they that, that the, the, the media heard from these guys, you know, talking about it. Um, and uh, I think it kind of, you know, um, uh, kind of closed the chapter on that after after showing this. Yeah, because I do know that Ozzy Gein, I believe, was one of the guys that really had to, I think, fly to the Dominican and really talk Hanley, you know, into just being okay with moving positions. Because at first, I think it was a, a very big deal to Hanley, the star of the team at the time, from moving to, you know, the prime position of shortstop to third base. And there's somebody else I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that Reyes was, you know, devastated. Were there any other players that just had, you know, tough times with players leaving? Because there's a lot of trades at that trade deadline, along before Hanley and after. So there's any other, you know, player reactions to uh, some some peculiar trades. No, I, I think the whole team was kind of surprised that they were having that many trades because there was so much, especially in spring training, there was so much optimism about this team. Um, and, uh, you know, when you look at, on paper, um, you know, this, this, that team was built to win and make a splash. You know, it was, like I said, it was the first year the the ballpark was open and, and, and the, and the new name change. So, you know, the, uh, you know, Jeffrey Loria wanted it to be like a Broadway show. He wanted people to f- fill the stands and come see these stars. They were great players. And, um, and so there was, it, you know, he did his job, you know, uh, you know, bringing in some really high priced, talent and some really, you know, really recognized names. And uh, I think if you go back and look at the stats for that, that year, what the, you know, the most amazing thing is that everybody across the board kind of had off years that year. Um, and so, um, and so I, I think there was just, uh, I think everybody was kind of just like disappointed more than anything else that, um, that it didn't go according to plan. You know, I know that, you know, Stanton went down and, um, and the likes and, uh, um, uh, but, um, you know, it was just a shame because we, we were really excited about, uh, featuring the Marlins in the franchise just because of the star power of the team. It's incredible that you just said that that was exactly what Isaac was talking about before the show about how everybody underperformed across the roster. And like in hindsight, people may point to certain flaws in the roster or certain players that maybe were overpaid, but in the aggregate, this was not something you could really see coming. Like anybody that was paying close attention to baseball thought that this was at the very least a team that would contend with the playoffs that would be in the mix for most of the season. So yeah, we're, we're on the same page about that, how it just veered in a direction that you really could not have anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Cause even you mentioned like Hanley, a superstar, he was hitting in the two forties. Gabby Sanchez is coming off a great year and all-star selection. He got sent down at some point in the year. Josh Johnson, the ace of the team didn't perform well. It was just really a kick in the groin that how every single player and every single free agent that they signed, Burley included and Reyes included, they all performed under his expectation. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I don't know how often that happens. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, cause you, you kind of figure that it, you know, it's kind of like a bell curve. Maybe it's all going to even out at the end of the, by the end of the season, right. You might start out slow. You might start, out, you're going to have dip, you know, dips and dips and rises throughout the year. Um, so you just think that everything's going to kind of even out after the year and, and things are going to get on. Cause it's amazing how teams can start out so bad in spring training. Right. And start out and even be have a losing record in June and July, but then all of a sudden, you know, have a hot August and September and be in the playoffs. I mean, it's a long season. So, um, so yeah, it was just, uh, it was just kind of surprising that the, the, like it just stayed in a dip and never came out of it. Yeah. I had a question about uh, the owner, Jeffrey Loria. You know, we saw some clips there uh, focusing on him. You know, he's a big art collector, him collecting art. Just uh, was he adamant on having um, camera crews following him? Did he make it a point to have cameras follow him or was that just a choice to follow him throughout his days and during the season? Yeah, no, it was it was really our choice because we wanted to really get behind the scenes of what it was like to be an owner. And uh, Mr. Loria was also a very unique owner because of his business background. So um, we you know, a, a, a lot of the lawyers are. I mean, a lot, a lot of lawyers, a lot of the owners are lawyers or accountants or they're very dry. And uh, and uh, Mr. Loria was just, uh, you know, just an exciting character to be able to follow, just to kind of hear about his business. And he was very open about uh, his passion besides baseball was the was the art world. And and uh, and just being able to follow him and get to get to, get to know him a little bit, you know, because I think he had been maligned for for a, a good number of years. So nobody really took the time to really get to know him and. 
and and see what it's about. He did love this team. He he was I, I, he was down at spring training. He was in the room with Ozzy when he was throwing all those f bombs around, and he absolutely loved it. And uh, you know he's a baseball fan, and so um, it was uh, uh, it was something that we wanted to do. We wanted to really get to know him a little bit better, and and, and especially because he's not your prototypical owner in, in the in the path of how he he came to uh, uh, came to baseball. David, are there any like particular segments that stick out in your mind as ones that you're especially proud of uh, from any one of the episodes that you felt uh, exactly captured and whatever whatever that means to you really in terms of what you felt was a successful production that really encapsulated what was going on or took the viewers somewhere where they wouldn't ordinarily be able to get to you. You brought up some examples already, so maybe those are others, but I wanted to give you an opportunity in case there are other segments that really stick out in your minds that you thought were really exceptional. Yeah. You know, I think the, um, the, the whole Ozzy, just Ozzy in general, just the amount of access he gave us. And uh, it was such a pleasure to, to, to follow him. And, you know, when he got suspended, that was a really raw moment. Uh, the Heath Bell moment um, was also a raw moment from a player's perspective. I'm not so sure, you know, he was, Heath was exactly thrilled after the fact of, uh, of uh of uh the whole world looking in when he was basically you know being called out for for you know being benched and the reason why he was being benched because he wasn't performing basically um as the way he wanted to in wanted to be the other one was uh uh giancarlo when he underwent um uh, arthroscopic arthroscopic surgery you know how many times you know i don't know if you could even do that these days because of a legal perspective but how many times you actually have to see somebody go in and be operated on and especially a star player like this. So uh, he was super cool. Uh, the doctors were super cool. And um, I think that was also a special moment that stood out just because it just showed the kind of access that we were, we were, you know, we were, you know, getting access to was, was really top shelf uh, type of access. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm glad you mentioned that scene because it was so, it was insane to look at that because not only, you know, it was a loose bodies in the right knee, I think it was, and there you were, you know, the cameraman in the doctor's office, in the surgery room showing. And then when the loose bodies were eventually removed, we, we saw the actual loose bodies taken out of his knee. So it was just great television. And, you know, obviously, in my opinion, and I was watching these episodes religiously, every single one of them from start to finish. I, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you guys cut the season short by one episode. I think maybe, maybe there was a, a tough time to create content. Was that the reason why? Or because I do think it was cut one episode short, correct? No, I think we were, it was, um, it was kind of like, um, it was never really etched in stone how many episodes. It was basically yeah. however long the narrative was going to play out. So right. we were, we were always, it was, I think the last episode was going to be, um, uh, was it going to be an hour and we were going to cut it into two half hours um, or if it was just a, it was just a half hour, but we felt like we were, we, I, I, we were given a, a cutoff date of how long we were going to spend with uh with the team and so um um so it it just basically ran its course and uh you know with with the narrative uh of, of where it was going and it was a rebuilding year and the likes and so uh we felt like you know we had started out with the, the highs of the highs and the expectations of where this team could be and then just to see it kind of like you know unfortunately kind of crumble before you um, you know, the, the series kind of kind of ran its course. It wasn't, you know, I guess if we were going to um, stick, if the team was going to make it into the playoffs and really rebound, we were, we were talking about coming back um, later that year. Now, now I'm remembering it. It was basically we were going to come back at the end of the year. We had saved an episode because we were anticipating that the team was going to do so well uh, or at least make a run at the playoffs that we were saving a half hour to come back. Like I th we finished filming in August and we were going to come back in September, continue filming and then do an episode in September. But once uh, once it looked like the uh, you know, where the where the team was headed and eventually heading, it didn't make sense to, to, to uh, come back for that postseason run. That never really happened. Yeah, um, my, my question is, uh, were there any players that maybe didn't get enough focus on that you thought maybe should have maybe it was because of their personality or something like that? Because the, the the team also had players like Carlos Zambrano, Logan Morrison, um, Gabby Sanchez, who's from Miami. Were there any players that maybe you thought that should have gotten maybe a little more screen time? No, we like to say that all those three players that you mentioned, we showed love to, to all those three players, especially Zambrano. We had him wired in a game for the first time in his career. 
And, you know, I think there was a, there was a section where, you know, he always had like, he was a, you know, he was a very fiery type pitcher who would get in your face. And, argue. and uh, I think there was a scene where uh, one of the players let a couple of runs get in. Uh, one of the fielders let a couple of runs get in and, and Carlos on, on the, on the, on the wire. I got you. It's no problem. We'll get this back kind of thing. So, um, but in the, the box set, you'll see all those players that you mentioned, they all got their fair share of uh, fair share of airtime for sure. I'm so glad you brought that up about having him mic'd up for the game, because that is something that uh, I guess they haven't quite taken that step baseball yet in terms of doing that regularly for like real regular season games. They've toyed around with it for the all-star game and for spring training games in the year since with uh, productions that Fox has done uh, with, I think MLB network itself has played around with that as well. That was a fascinating step. Was there any hesitancy from Zimbrano to actually wear a mic during the game just because for someone like him, especially if you've been in the league for so long and you're so in tune with your body um, and perhaps maybe superstitious about certain ways that you go about your game. Uh, I'm curious, at least in that particular instance, uh, he was, he was okay with doing that, even though it was something that is very different and something that maybe would make you feel self-conscious. That It's something that's just so foreign to what baseball players are used to. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they're so self-conscious about it. I think what you, you you touched on it exactly. They're so superstitious about everything. Like if it's completely different, like you know, like Wade Boggs ate chicken every day for his entire career. I mean, he, you know, baseball more than any other sport is just have these like wacky superstitions that the players kind of adopt, and they're not going to change from it. So if uh, you know, if he wore the wire and got shelled. He probably would have never worn the wire ever again. It, or if, you know, you know, we've had some players that you know, wore wire and had the best day of their best day of their lives. So they didn't mind wearing a wire going forward. There's a there's another program that we did for HBO called Derek Jeter 3K, where he followed him around for his 3000th hit. Um, he was six hits away and, uh, uh, and we followed him for those six hits. The day that he hit 3000, he went five for five. We had a game. We had a wireless microphone on him for the first time in his career. And uh, he had a home run on that, his 3000 hit. And so now he's like, Oh, maybe I should have been wearing a wire the whole time because he just had an incredible day. So, you know, it's kind of hit or miss. Some players are like, no, I'm not going to wear a wire. I don't feel comfortable. I might say something that's going to, you know, g- give away a competitive advantage to other batters or the likes, or, you know, regardless of whether or not we said, Hey, anything on the competitive nature, we're not going to put in. That was one of the stipulations that we weren't going to do anything that was going to, you know, give away anything that was going to be an advantage to your, you know, the, the other team that you were going up against. But um, so, for, for, so for the most part, um, you know, we didn't really run into those situations with this particular filming, but let me just tell you for other other players that we've had wired, it's just been it's again, it's been that bell curve. Some people have been great. Some people have been like, no way. I'm not going near that thing. Can you maybe share which names refused to uh, to wire up that season? Uh, I don't recall. You know, I don't think anybody on the team really refused on, on our season. I'm talking about over the, you know, the, the 16 years that I was at Major League Baseball. We had lots of players that just said, Nope, it's not something I'm accustomed to doing. I've never done it before. I'm not starting now. Okay. So it was more along those lines. Uh, and in those two seasons, you know, the Giants in 2011 and the Marlins in 2012, did it ever feel uncomfortable seeing just stuff that was really not meant for the public, like being sort of an interloper and just, you know, looking beneath the skirt and seeing so much stuff that really fans and no one else has access to? No, it was actually super cool. I thought we did more to help promote the game of baseball than – than uh, any other program that we that we had uh, produced and you know we were for the previous year with the giants we were showing you know uh players making it into the big leagues for the first time you know being told at spring training that they're they've made the team and them crying so just you know just all that kind of access kind of humanized the players and and really that was that was our that was our job at major league baseball production so it's basically you know my philosophy was that if you see a player um, signing an autograph for 10 kids, those 10 kids get the benefit of seeing that player sign the ball. But if I film that player um, signing those autographs and put it on air, then millions of people get the benefit of seeing him sign that ball. So that was really, that was really the, that was really our philosophy is how do we, how do we promote these players? How do we make them look real? How do we make them look, you know, you know, humanize these guys so that they're, they're uh, more relatable so that people are going to want to, 
you know, follow them more or, you know, watch what they're up to or, you know, even buy their cap or their jersey. Right. The key question coming off of that is for all the fascinating light that this series kind of shed that people wouldn't have ordinarily been able to see before is why did it end? Why was there not a third season of the franchise? What were you able to understand about why it wasn't brought back in 2013 with a different team? You know, I think it kind of still filters back to that whole superstitious component of Major yeah. League Baseball is that players, you know, we shot thousands of hours. You know, we every episode we had a cold down, you know, I think it was like 300 hours, over 300 hours that we that we filmed. And we had to cut that down into 30 minutes. So there was a lot of content to go through. So I think a lot of players and a lot of teams, no matter how many meetings we took the previous, the, the following year, you know, we, we saying, listen, they just felt like all this pressure to kind of perform, to kind of deliver what the Giants and the Marlins had delivered over the previous two years, that they didn't feel comfortable that they were going to be able to do it. No matter how much we told them, hey, listen, we're filming so much. We're, we're just taking the best of the best. And that's why it looks so good. We're not expecting you guys to, you know, every time we turn the camera on, there's going to be this compelling moment. So I, I think uh, that was really the big hurdle is that we just couldn't get other teams comfortable after seeing what the how great the the the, uh, the, the first two seasons were. And especially with the Marlins and all the access they had given us that that we could, you know, jump that hurdle for for another team to say we're going to we're, we feel comfortable doing the exact same thing. Uh, the last question for me I have for you is during the, you know, the 2012 one, we're focusing on the Marlins. Was there ever a, a, a heated exchange that or, you know, a, a you know, sketchy moment between players or even players and maybe cameramen? I know in June, frustration was really mounting. They, were, they lost almost every single game in the month of June. Was there ever a time where players were getting tested with each other or with the manager or anything like that? No, I think Ozzy was getting a little testy for sure. I think he was, uh, he was really, really getting frustrated. You know, he's super competitive, just like all the players are. So I think, I think, you know, he was, um, you know, he was kind of getting, you know, frustrated with, uh, with the team. And I think there were some heated moments that he would have but to the whole team. We'd kind of like lay it out in front, you know, and our, and our cameras were there. And it was basically saying like, you know, what's up with you guys? F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. You guys got to get your, you know get your F-bomb stuff together. You know, what the heck? You know, you guys are great Major League Baseball players. What is going on? So, um, you know, I think he was trying to cajole to, you know, whatever it was that he was trying to do to get these players just kind of get out of their funk. And uh, so, like you said, I think there were some frustrating moments in the locker room after games for sure uh, uh, during that year. The one thing I have to bring up because you mentioned him losing his temper is this is from somebody on Twitter, one of our followers, Wiggly Feels. He wanted to see if you remembered this rant that he went on. He used it as like a, a post-credit scene about when he was ranting about coconut water. He did it, I think, in front of all the media that was yeah, assembled. Yeah. Uh, this guy was just wondering about the context of that because it was it was gold. It was a, a solid minute, if not longer, of him just constantly F-bomb after F-bomb uh, talking about nonsense in front of, I think it was a pretty big crowd of all these reporters and TV people. Yeah, Ozzy's great TV. What, what, do you, what you, you turn a camera on a guy who doesn't have a filter and just let him loose. You know, he's very much an extrovert, right? So um, it doesn't take him, you know, it doesn't take much to, to, to have him, uh, you know, start just pontificating about anything that comes into his head. So that was, I think that was one of the reasons why we put it on there because it was just like, can you believe this guy? This is just, so, it's hysterical. So, uh, so that's, that's how that came about. We, we would try to find some, you know, free associations that, uh, that he would do to, to include in the post credit scenes to kind of give, uh, give a little bit extra bonus footage to, uh, to, to every episode. I remember that. I actually fibbed. I have one more question for you. Um, there was a couple of shots with, you know, the players' wives, the players' families. One of them, some of them were just with the players' wives on the boat, I believe it was, and there was a dinner scene. How willing were they to, you know, be on, national television the way they were were they excited for it were some players wise less excited than others how, how did that go especially heath bell's wife i believe was one of the main ones in one of the scenes so was she excited about being on you know knowing that her husband was struggling a bit yeah you know i think um i think again uh, the previous year we had done the same it was kind of in our playbook with uh, that we were going to go home with the players so we're going to learn more about their families and uh, the heath bell you know yes yes it was a a, a pretty open and honest um 
Dean, uh, you know, with, with Ozzy, but we also got a chance to go home and meet his family. And mm-hmm. that was that was even a more incredible scene to see him as a father and see him with his kids. And uh, and so, again, it just kind of helps kind of humanize the player to let him know that let let the audience know, the viewers know that these guys are just like us. They have families, they have kids, they have other mm-hmm. responsibilities as well so that you know going home and meeting the wives that was always part of our playbook um and so um you know what i you know we just kind of identified who we thought would be you know what would be the best stories along those lines and uh and just kind of uh went from there but nothing really any kind of pushback because again because of what we had done the previous year people kind of knew what to expect yeah for me were there um any moments that maybe didn't make the cut that maybe you thought or anyone else that, you know, it would have made for great television. Uh, maybe it was a player, manager, or anything like that. Maybe a moment that that should, probably should have made television or was just close to it. Now, you know, I think we did a pretty good job. I mean, when you get, when you're in the operating room of your star player um, and getting permission to do that, that's uh that's uh, you know, I, th- I think we were kind of amazed that we were allowed to, to do that um, just because of uh, you know, if something went wrong, in the surgery, you know, you know, we were there, you know, there, <laughs> you know, so there could have been some uh, liability issues. So I, I don't think I've seen many athletes going under the knife on any other shows recently, but um, so we were really happy to be a part of that. Uh, granted it was, it was, uh, I think it was pretty routine surgery, uh, but still that was uh, pretty, pretty impactful. And just the cooperation from the team and from the owner on down, you know, letting us know that, um, you know, we had embedded a camera crew there and, and they we really became like part of the team and they welcomed us in. And so whenever a big moment was going to happen, you know, they always made sure that we're there filming. And, and, and again, after a while, you start to kind of blend in because you have to remember, we're not really asking questions when we're there. Uh, we're just filming and uh, we'll have a t- we'll have a time during the production where we'll have scheduled interview times. Like we'll go back and look at the footage and then we'll find something that's like, oh, this could be a really cool storyline, you know, based on what we're seeing from the footage. And then we would have set times where we'd interview the players to talk about certain things that we had filmed so that we could have, you know, supporting sound as we're building each one of those shows. Good. Before we let you go, I was really fascinated in what you're currently doing in um, business developments with WSC Sports seems to be on like the entire opposite ends of the production spectrum instead of working in like closely manufacturing um, <clears throat> a, a scripted, well, an unscripted show, but uh, downsizing a show and saving the best, the best parts of it and putting it out. It's uh, turning around almost instantly highlights that you get from games themselves and allowing these sports leagues to disseminate them. And it's something that just hits very personally to me as somebody that runs our social media at fish stripes understanding how important and engaging it is to share highlights of games as soon as they happen um and i've had to do some creative things to like come up with those highlights as fast as possible but this technology that seems to kind of automate almost every step of the way is something that just really fascinates me there's anything that you could tell us about exactly how that works and um what kind of clients you work with to turn around those highlights as quickly as you do? Yeah, it's a really, thanks for asking that question because uh, I've been working with WSC sports for a couple of years now. And um, you know, I'm, I did come up in production. I started out as an editor at CNN sports and continue that at the NBA. So I kind of have like this, you know, holistic view of editing and what it takes to get something on air, whether it's for live television production or for post-production like the franchise was. And and so when I was reading about WSC back in like November of 2019, the headline that I was reading is that this Israeli tech company is using AI and machine learning to automatically cut highlights in real time. And I went, what? It, and I, I didn't believe it. I just, I, I thought that this was like BS. I didn't, I, I couldn't believe uh, that, th- that there was AI that was taking the place and ev- editors and, and basically cutting content within seconds of an event happening on the field or on the course or on the court and distributed it anywhere in the world instantaneously. And so I, like, I got to find out more information about this company. And so the more and more information I found out about it, um, the, the, uh, the more and more I was just super impressed. So uh, to give you an example, at Major League Baseball Productions, we would have loggers and 
our best logger could log a two and a half hour, three hour baseball game, um, maybe 250 events in that game, you know, and that's with like a drop down menu. You point, you click on the player's face, a drop down menu comes down, offense, defense with subcategories in there. So our AI can look at that same game and log 1500 data points and create a highlight for every one of those data points that happens in the game. So now you kind of have like this Google for plays. So now if you want it, you can tell the AI, I want two minutes of highlights. I want 25 minutes of highlights. I just want the best goals. Or I just all want all the home runs or I just want all the touchdowns. You tell the AI what you want with like five clicks of a button and it'll literally distribute it, distribute it anywhere in the world instantaneously within seconds of the action finishing on, on the field of play. So it's a uh, really, really super cool tech. And it's like the next evolution in, uh, um, in uh, television production and television editing. Um, and uh, you've, 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 we're working with everybody, anybody that owns sports rights, uh, we can work with. So, you know, it, it ranges from the networks to the leagues, to associations, to tournaments, you name it. We're, we're pretty much, we have over 200 clients worldwide and all the big names that you would, you would uh, think uh, would be a part of it. Yeah, like I said, I've tried my best as like a one man band of trying to record things and, and put them up as quickly as possible. But to understand that this is kind of the way that digital media is going in terms of trying to capture that stuff as quickly as possible and not necessarily worrying about the entire game, but just the most critical moments of it and also getting the right angles of it. It really is a fascinating science. So um, that's Best of luck to you continuing to do that. And we greatly appreciate all the time that you spent here. This is with David Gavant, who was overseeing the franchise 10 years ago, as crazy as that feels, um, for that Marlins season on Showtime. Uh, this has been the official show on the Fish Drives podcast. Eli Sussman, Isaac Azut, Daniel Rodriguez, a whole lot uh, more content coming. But this is, like I said, David, I meant it up top. This is one of the things I was looking forward to most during this lockout as something that uh, I know that people are going to, in light, in lieu of spring training games, of actual transactions happening, this is this has a surprisingly avid audience even now. That for people that didn't see it when the show came out in real time, uh, this is more valuable. And even for those that did and probably haven't watched it since then, uh, this was going to bring back a whole lot of memories flooding into their heads. And with this extra context, it's it's been awesome. Thank you so much. Well, thank you guys for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure meeting you guys and talking about this. And like you said, it's hard to believe it's been uh, it's been 10 years and uh, uh, it's been uh, really, really a lot of fun uh, talking to you guys about it. So we'll have uh, more on this pod channel. Fish Stripes Unfiltered coming up uh, this weekend. Everywhere you get your pods, just subscribe to Fish Stripes and uh, you'll find it right there. So we'll keep covering everything as close as possible with this lockout going on but this was a great way to make that time go a little bit quicker. So we appreciate all the support. And as always, go fish.